common species which you can recognize in the environment um, and which have a, a tried and tested use for being reflective of uh, <coughs> changes in ambient levels of a particular contaminant, in this case heavy metals. And aquatic indicators in marine systems um, make a lot of use out of algae. Algae are particularly brilliant for accumulating heavy metals. They reflect what's in the water. So they tell you the water water concentration, rather than that maybe associated with sediments or food, for example. Um, so they are really good. And, and, and I selected several species, and I put some of the more common ones here. Padina, I uh, relied on heavily. Um, Sargassum here, Turbinaria. Limpets will put in because they are particularly sensitive to cadmium. No matter what species, the levels are more or less the same for every, every, every species all over the world. Um, and because there's so much work <coughs> being done on cadmium uptake in limpets, they really are useful organisms um, to give you some indication of whether there are elevated levels in the environment. So we threw those in as well. And just taking you back to our original sites for soil and sediment analysis, I now superimpose a map for biota analysis over there. It's not quite as extensive. It's, it's uh, pretty enthusiastic, I must admit, but it's, it's not as extensive as that one. Uh, uh, there we go. Just press the right button. Okay, there we go. So soils and biota. <coughs> Again, from the Gingham Point as far up as Bird Island, um, if you ever try collecting limpets off a rock um, on the cliff at Banzai, don't. It's extraordinarily dangerous. Um, <coughs> we only lost three people trying to do it, so I gave up after that very technique. One of the advantages of working with students, dollar a day labor, students of readily disposable uh, items. <laughs> so, and you can get more of them quite easily. I'm only joking, student population out there. I have every respect for human life, including students. All right, um, just reflecting back on some of the data from the soil and sediments. This presents to you the average levels of mercury in soils and sediments that we got from phase one of the study. And if you see a little asterisk here, it means this is a soil sample, do it over here. But they don't have asterisk for sediments, just so you can keep that clear in your mind. There are two baselines. The sediment baseline um, is very low compared with the soil. You know, I think it leaks down in the water. So sediments tend to be much lower, typically, than either limestone or volcanic sediments. <clears throat> and the sediments we have around here, that is a baseline value for mercury. Usually between 5 and 10 uh, nanograms per gram. Note that the scale there is nanograms per gram, so we are parts per billion. Um, that's micrograms per kilogram or nanograms per gram. Um, the flag waving over Gingham Point. So, respectable concentration. I wouldn't freak out over that, but you know, anything around 100 is sign of contamination, but not gross contamination. It's contamination. Considering that baseline levels are around about five, so to get something in order of magnitude or 20 times higher, it's polluted, but not excessively so. Anyway, um, <coughs> you'll note here that we have some lalag sites. <coughs> One, three, four, five. What happened to two? Um, well, it simply means that we didn't collect um, soil sample from two. I'll show you why. Here's the Lao Lao site. Most of the soil samples that came from Lao Lao were taken just adjacent to the road. We were driving along as soon as we find a, um, a river or a stream that popped over the road, we took a sample. Um, especially if it was in an area of a dump site. So there were soil samples collected there. 
here, here, and at the point here, at the discharge point, but not at two. Not at, <coughs> not at two. So you will find some of the samples of limpets that algae were probably collected in Lao too as well. So for birds, you don't have the asterisks. Okay, um, this is limpets. What do you say about that? Well, first of all, baseline levels are around about 5, invariably less than 10. Um, usually, they're, they're actually less than 5. But I put this line here because it represents the lower limit of the samples uh, that we were getting. So there is, I would, and this is, in a highly polluted environment, you can get levels up to about 50 parts per billion mercury in lipids. Worldwide, it doesn't really matter where they are, what species, they've all got really similar affinities for this animal, which makes it really nice because interspecific responses can screw up monitoring. If, you're, if you don't know what the species are, um, then it can lead to problems. But for limpets, it doesn't appear to fly that way. But anyway, our high levels, um, if you can call them high levels, but Here's our highs here. We have one at the King Gang, there's a high level of mercury there. And we have one at Bird Island. And they were some of the highest, uh, one of the highest, or one of the higher uh, mercury levels was found in sediments from from um, from Bansai. From Bansai from Bird Island. Uh, cadmium. Now, can, I didn't mention this in passing because none of the cadmium values at PC the DEQ uh, sort of screening level. But there was an obvious trend towards increased enrichment of cadmium um, as you move further north in the northern part of the island, particularly around Bird Island, um, coming down to Nanasu, um, with a couple of blips, Marine Beach, um, down here at Lao Lao. These may be different sources, but this area here, this trio, represents something going on here. I have no idea where cadmium comes from. It's not something you find in large amounts in local rocks. Um, it was used quite extensively toward the end of the last war for protective anti-corrosive coatings on artillery shells, and in some case, equipment. And depending on the method of disposal, and I think there is, I've never been to this particular cave, but there's a cave very close to Bird Island where a lot of ordnance were discarded and are still there apparently. Now cadmium is quite soluble compared with many other metals, so it's possible that over time cadmium being mobilized from this particular source into these areas, maybe. It's a hypothesis. Or maybe there's kind of independence, or maybe there's a diffuse source, and maybe there's um, um, highly localized sources, such as the, such as the um, ordinance in the cave. We don't know yet, but it's just interesting. But you'll note the limpets show a similar pattern. Now this is interesting, because if you, if you have a pattern in the soil, it's reflected in your indicator, it kind of pretty much suggest that what you see is what you've got. And if you look at here, you definitely increase in rise in cadmium. You've got almost two groups of data. One kind of hanging around the baseline level, and another group which is above it. Now without these two, this is probably a straight line or close to it, as with this big in all probability. But then you have the bird island. Um, we have south and north. Uh, samples of limpets, which tend to push it up a bit. So there's something going up Bird Island, which really um, is showing up in, in limpets. And the interesting thing is it's also showing up in Padina. Now, Padina cadmium levels are very consistent. Now, here's the Bird Island part, standing up like a sore thumb. So something's going on there, for sure. Um, there's all three of them put together. When you have something like that, two different indicators and soil profile to indicate um, enrichment in a particular area, chances are is that um, what you actually see is what you've actually got. Lead. <clears throat> now, the thing to note about this graph is that this is on a log scale. 
Um, and you can quite see why this fellow flies are flying over his head. This is over a thousand parts per million at the Gingham Point in the soil, in the sediments, rather, that we took out of Gingham. This is a typical baseline value for sediments and soil, less than a part per million, and we're up over a thousand. A lot. Yeah. Now, here's an aerial of the site. This is where dumping took place off this point here. The actual sediment value was collected around this area here. But we've since been back to this site and taken transects all the way out. I went all the way along here. I looked at Biota along here as well. And this whole area is fairly heavily contaminated. There's a, a lead footprint. Um, which extends for about a quarter of a mile from the point uh, north. Um, this is limpets. Limpets are not particularly good indicators of lead, but nonetheless, the levels that we were finding um, that may be good indicators, but they don't have a good um, affinity for lead. So they don't accumulate too much in the face of pollution. But what they do get is often significantly above the sort of control values yeah. And this would appear to be the case here. This kind of baseline. And then here at the beginning then it's higher. Um, Hedina Saint. Now lead is accumulated by algae fairly well. And in highly polluted situations you can get up to 100 parts per million or more in algae species. And brown algae is particularly good at it. And our highest value is 12. So, moderate biological availability, not, I mean, it's, it's getting into the biota, but not in hugely high amounts. Um, that's the good news, from your perspective. From mine, it means that I don't get to do something exciting with this anymore, because we can say, okay, getting into the biota, but not in concentrations which are really worth investigating further. I mean, we don't have to dig the darn beach up and replace it with fresh sand or anything like that. So that's good. Um, here's some other seaweeds that we looked at. I don't know if you're familiar with these species. But we've got plenty here. You can, you can actually see that's Dictyota. We've seen Podina already, but there it is again. Calerpa, we already know, I would think. This is one that looks like little grapes or peas. In fact, it's called some grapes, I think. Um, Beautiful algae, one of my favorites. Um, and you'll notice that all of these have got fairly similar levels, elevated levels of lead. Now, normally, you wouldn't expect it to be um, above about 0.2 or 0.3 parts per million max. Um, but there are some indication, too, here from this last one, turban area, that not all algae species do accumulate um, heavy metals in the same way. The turban area is one such um, species. It could be because the volume ratio is very different in turban area than it is in the more fleshy, um, membranous type of algae, like, especially like that, you know, the um, Getting back to the <coughs> point, because that's where we are at the moment, those samples were taken all the way along this reef edge here. Um, Dino came back in the more shallow, sheltered areas. But chlorodescence came from here, as did, uh, as did uh, um, the turban area. The um, Dictyota and Podina uh, more in this general area. That's beyond this line here is essentially where the footprint starts to get a little fuzzy. So this whole area um, is substantially contaminated with lead. Where it's coming from, I, I really don't know. Because it's in very much larger quantities than I would expect from someone dumping car batteries over here. But this is an invasion site. And there were, and there was a lot of activity going on in here in 1944. Lots of shelling. Um, after the war, there was a bunker, apparently, on here, which was storing munitions. Um, lead, of course, and munitions. Maybe that's the sort. I don't know. Or maybe it's coming from further afield. 
haven't sorted that one out yet. Moving around the point, there's the point there. We're moving south now. Um, and I've got five sites indicated here because it does look like um, there's still some enrichment going on. With, here's the five sites. That's a Gingan, and here's these four other sites. So we have here are the four other sites right here, getting down to uh, that point. One, two, three, four, five. And, and then you have this little one up here. This is Lao Lao, again, Lao Lao site one. I don't suppose you remember, so I put it up for you, but Lao Lao is on site one. It was a, a site of enrichment for um, other metals as well. Um, for example, mercury was high in Lao Lao site one, and also cadmium relatively high in uh, site one as well. Uh, so in summary then, we are doing well. One quarter to eight. Um, overall, low metal content and low metal enrichment seen in most. Oh no, we're not done yet. I got fish to throw. Oh, okay. So, uh, <laughs> low metal enrichment seen in bioindicators at most sites. Um, the notable exception being a thing point adjacent to the which were extensively contaminated with lead may have some sort of ecological significance, maybe getting their fisheries out. If you're a fish, if you eat fish and you worry about the lead, no need to, because fish allows the accumulators of lead for some reason, and that's good from our point of view. They don't accumulate high concentrations of lead in the same way as they might mercury. Um, and the same goes for cadmium. They respond very poorly. So you don't generally use fish as bioindicators for those two metals. But for mercury, of course you do. Mercury is the most toxic metal that I looked at, followed probably by cadmium and then by lead. Uh, high cadmium is sediment on the northeast coastline source, I don't know. Anticorrosive coatings on ordnance, maybe. There's some mercury, a gingham, maybe of concern. Um, Likewise, up around bonsai, we have mercury, cadmium, and lead, maybe getting into fisheries, you know, for sure. So we're going to what about fish? Um, very quickly, then, in the remaining few minutes, the indicator of fish that I chose for this is myopristus, because it doesn't move around a whole hell of a lot. It's um, got limited foraging ranges. To hang around a very small group of coral or a bombing for most of its life. So if you analyze <coughs> the flesh from one of these, what you see is something which is fairly representative of the area from which you capture. And we have a lot of data for it too. Um, back a few years ago, probably we started last century, didn't we Mike? Late last century, catching Wirepristers from Tanapag Lagoon and from uh, the upper section or the northern section of Tanapag um, Lagoon. And what do you have here? It's a This thing has a mind of its own. <coughs> Control. These are from clean coastal sites in Tanapag. Um, and we're comparing it with the ones we were finding in Micro Beach and Harvard. Now we know these are contaminated sites, or at least they were. Um, and they may still well be to some extent. These, these samples are quite old, um, 2001 uh, to 2004. There was an incinerator in the hospital grounds which was told to burn everything. Now, hospital waste typically contains lots of mercury. And some of this mercury was being washed down the little gully into that swale that runs along the middle road. And during wet weather conditions, would end up going into a storm drain which discharged just to the south of Happaday Hotel. Um, and there was quite a difference um, after two years once that incinerator was closed down to the mercury levels that were in um, myopristus from the inner area. What do you have are the early values here? 
for Myrtle Priestess in Hathaway Beach. Very high. Now, we, we, we speculated that Micro Beach was probably contaminated as well because of the way currents drift and sediments coming down that discharge right. being washed um, north. But sediments don't always wash north. In fact, currents kind of go either way. So we've always been a bit of a loose end as to whether a micro beach levels of mercury and fish are actually coming from the same source as they are in Papadain, namely the uh, Commonwealth Health Center incinerator, which is now closed, by the way. It closed down in 2006. Um, more sounds from fish base, near shore, offshore, and near the ODI bar, I presume. Um, levels start to rise up again. And this year we're looking at samples further south, anticipating that the rise that you see, or you get a hint, maybe the levels are beginning to rise, um, may be continuing as you move south in the lagoon as a result of the shelling and the release of mercury fulminates during the discharge and so on and so forth. So let you know more about that next year. Um, these are just sample numbers in parentheses. So what you see is just a range of values, hugely variable, and there's a reason for that. I'll tell you in a minute um, why that occurs. And you've just got the geometric mean here. Geometric means tend to be useful for methods because most are long normally distributed. So a geometric mean gives you the best estimate of central tendency. Um, we looked at fish from four sites, from five sites. Again, down down here at Naftan Point, Naftan East or Naftan Cliff Line, Bird Island. Uh, we can get permits for this, by the way. Bird Island is a sanctuary area. We actually couldn't get quite into the area we wanted, so we had to collect from a site to the south of the, um, the Bird Rock, where most of the limpets came from around this area. So we were a little bit far removed. At that point in time, we didn't get in any of um, Okay, again from point, those are the sources. Now at some point you've seen all those before. I'm gonna see them again. Uh, east, yep, we've seen all that. Don't need any more now. Bird Island, that's the only shot I got of that. Um, Bansai. We know there's stuff there. They try and detonate it at one stage. All the live ordinance that were on the seabed were it was attempted to blow them up, but I understand it kind of blew some of the cliff side off in the process. Not a particularly successful operation. But anyway, so here's the values that we got for Myropristus. Um, these are the values that I showed you before for Tanapag, Garapan, Labu. And these are the samples that we got for those five sites on the eastern side. Uh, and this is control, and Burn Island is actually quite clean by comparison. But there is some enrichment, albeit kind of small, um, at Nathan Point, which is as I would expect, because there were hugely high concentrations of mercury and soda. That value we saw up around um, over a thousand. And Bansai Cliff, actually, funnily enough, there wasn't too much in the way of mercury in the sediments at Bansai, but it was certainly above baseline. So something's going on here. You know, um, closing quickly, this is not a good way to prevent data. It's convenient, uh, but one of the reasons they, they, um, they may vary, which is hidden there, is that rarely do you get the same size distribution at every species. You may get large fish at one site, and you may get very small fish at another. So it's, you know, it's apples and oranges, simply because fish tend to accumulate um, more mercury with age. The older they are, the higher the mercury levels in their tissues. So if you're comparing an apple, a young fish, with an orange, an old fish, they may be reacting to exactly the same ambient concentration, except the older one's been around longer, and so it's accumulated more of it. So it's not a particularly good way. That little line that just sprung up here, here this represents the concentration of mercury below which you can eat fish in any amount without any restriction at all. If your average values were to exceed this, then you would have to go into kind of emergency mode and depending on the levels, plan on 
eating X number of fish meals per month. The higher the mercury concentration, the fewer fish meals. But below that red line, everything's hunky dory. So you could safely say, maybe, out from that data at least, that there's really no need to worry about anything. It's just kind of an academic interest. But anyway, back to the size dilemma. That's Banzai Cliff fish. You can clearly see that there's a real strong size relationship there. So what do you do about that? Because you can't, you can't get the same size range for every site. It's virtually impossible. So what you do is normalize the data to a particular size. And in this case, you know, I kind of just showed 16 centimeter fish size. So you do this for all your data sets from all the areas that you look at and get the value of mercury concentration for a particular size fish, in this case, 16 centimeter for a uh, <clears throat> And in closing now, I've done the same for all the other data sets that you saw earlier. These are all normalized data sets. Um, for the sites that we just looked at, from that down to Bird Island, Comparing with the Tanapak controls and the Garapan living sample. Um, in virtually every case, you can eat as much as you want for as long as you want, with the exception of possibly um, fish that you're dragging out from Segula oleae. Um, certainly, the half a day beach area prior to the um, incinerator being closed, um, no more than like 60 per month for that particular fish species at that particular site. But this doesn't apply to other uh, fish which may have even more. Some of the thrydids um, um, and, uh, and the other carnivorous fish may have higher levels. So you really need to do it for each species. Um, so really no need to worry too much there. Darn summary. Near, for, near shore fisheries and vicinity of World War II dump sites along the eastern seaboard. Modest to say the least, mercury impaction, no immediate health hazards, level generally lower than an equivalent size fish in the central and southern sections of South Africa. I think that's a fair statement to make. So the western side of the island tends to be um, a little, generally a little bit more contaminated than the eastern side of the island, as far as fish are concerned. Some people I should acknowledge. Um, they did try to get samples of limpets from the Sanguine Cliff area. Um, no life to lost. But Dave Benaventi, who was the um, intrepid explorer uh, and fearless uh, seaman, John Igwell, who I don't know why they call themselves nowadays. It used to be Coastal Resource Management Office, but I understand they go under a different name. But whatever they are, you know what they are. And Todd Miller, of course who made sure that we took all the right permits, otherwise he threatened to throw us in jail. Had no choice there. And that's about it. And here's the guy who started it all. This was not really my idea. Um, this was Starmer, John Starmer, who was also Coastal Resorts Management Office when it was called that. And it was his idea to actually go and look at some of these um, organisms and sites, looking at samples of metals and so on. So thank you, John. All right.